Okay, so we can start and we will begin with three bows to the triple gem. One, two, two, three. And then the salutation. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Okay, so now we're continuing our examination of the Anguttara Nikaya, and we're in the Book of Fives, and I'm sort of jumping to the more interesting suttas or those that need some explanation. So now we come to sutta number 23, which has the title Defilements. And actually the Pali word used here, you see the word defilement is a very broad, broad word. The Pali word is upakilesa, which also has a sense, something of a sense of like a corruption. Um, and we'll see the way it's used in the simile. So the text begins with the simile, so the Buddha says that there are these five upakilesas of gold. So you could see like gold, of course, is not a mind that's subject to defilements, but these are like impurities or corruptions of gold. Bhante, can you make the text a bit larger? Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's make it full screen. Whoops. How does this look? How does this look? That's, yeah, that's better, Bhante. Okay. Much better. Thank you. Okay. okay, so we have these five corruptions of gold, impurities of gold. It's upakilesa. The word is upakilesa, defiled by which, again, and here the text uses the adjectival uh, correspondent upa kilita the upa kilita defiled by which gold is not malleable, wieldy, and luminous, but brittle and not properly fit for work. So this is using the case of, as we'll see, of a goldsmith who's going to be using gold, taking gold and refining the gold in order to use it for the kind of work that the goldsmith is charged with, which in this case, it's producing ornaments, golden ornaments. So what are these five impurities of gold? Iron, copper, tin, lead, and silver. Of course, I don't have <laughs> any work experience as a goldsmith, and I just wonder how gold would get mixed with these five, with these other kinds of metals, but I guess that is the case. So anyway, when gold gets alloyed with these other metals, then it becomes brittle and it's not properly fit to make ornaments. But then when the gold is freed from those five defilements, then it becomes malleable, sort of soft, wieldy, and bright, luminous in its pliant and properly fit for work. And the Pali words that are used here also are used to describe the mind. I just had the file a few minutes ago. Yeah. 
So they're in a way they're loaded words. Because they're words that the Buddha often uses to describe the mind. So being mudu is being soft. And an ideal for a person is to have a soft character. And the ideal for the mind is for the mind to be soft and that the mind can be shaped according to manipulated and moved according to one's wishes. To be kamaniyang means fit for work. Workable, here translated wieldy. And then we have pabasaran, which is luminous. It's based on basara, which means light or brightness. So that's these are qualities of gold and also qualities of the well trained mind, as we'll see. And then the opposite of that is being brittle and not fit for work. Okay. But when the gold is freed from these five defilements, then it becomes malleable, wieldy, and luminous, pliant, and properly fit for work. And then whatever kind of ornament one wishes to make, uh, the goldsmith wants to make from it, and mentions the number of ornaments, one can achieve one's purpose. One could get the kind of object that one wants. Okay, so now the simile of the working of gold, the refinement of gold, whoops, is used to illustrate the process of refining the mind. And so here the Buddha mentions five chittas upakilesa, five defilements of the mind, impurities of the mind, corruptions of the mind, defiled by which the mind is not malleable and so on. And so we have these five upakilesas of the chitta of the mind. And then we have here upakilitang defiled by which, by these defilements, the mind is not malleable, wieldy, and luminous, but brittle and not properly concentrated for the destruction of the asavas. The, here translated the taints. So the purpose of the goldsmith in refining the gold is to make some ornament from it. The purpose of the practitioner, the Buddhist practitioner, in refining the mind, in removing the corruptions of the mind, is to make the mind a suitable instrument for samadhi. And then the purpose of that samadhi is the destruction of the asavas. And so what are the five, these five corruptions or defilements of the mind? And here they're enumerated, sensual desire, ill will, dullness, and drowsiness. So these two are grouped into one because they have a common characteristic of being on the side of, you could say, sluggishness or heaviness. And then we have two others joined together, restlessness and remorse. So these two are two separate factors, but they're joined together as one corruption because they're on the side of agitation or distress, distress of the mind. And then the fifth is doubt. And so those are the five defilements of the mind, 
And then when the mind is freed from these five, five defilements, it becomes malleable, wieldy, and luminous, just like the gold, same terms they use. Malleable, wieldy, and luminous, pliant, and properly fit for its task. And that task is to be unified in samadhi and concentration. And then one applies that concentrated mind to the goal. This is the goal of the teaching, the destruction of the asavas. Okay, but then the text continues that this is a little bit, seems a little bit of a sidetrack here, since the previous sentence men mentions the ultimate goal is the destruction of the asavas. But then the text says that if there is a suitable basis, one is then capable of realizing any state that can be attained by direct knowledge towards which one might incline the mind. And then what are, the, what are those states realizable by direct knowledge? And then the text will mention first the five mundane abhinyas, what comes to be called the abhinyas. Oops. Yeah, so in the commentaries and the Visuddhi Mukha in the commentaries, all of these five um, practices that are going to be mentioned are grouped under the designation abhinya, which could be rendered as direct knowledge or higher knowledge or super knowledge. And they involve the acquisition of certain kinds of supernormal powers. Let me remove myself from the, okay. Yeah, so here they're just spoken of as states realizable by direct knowledge, but later they come to be called the direct knowledges themselves. So we have the exercise of the psychic powers. And I'll come back later and look at these in more detail. Then the divine ear element, then the ability to know the minds of others, of other people. And then comes the recollection of one's past abodes, that is one's past births or one's past lives, even over many aeons. Then comes the divine eye by which one can see how other beings pass away and take rebirth in accordance with their karma. And then comes, the, so these five are the, called the five mundane direct knowledges, lokia abhinya. And then the last is the one that was mentioned in the previous section as the aim for freeing the mind from the five hindrances and unifying the mind in samadhi, that is the destruction of the taints. But for some reason, the text, the sutta takes us on a kind of detour through the five mundane super knowledges. And then at the end, finally, it comes to the direct goal, which is the destruction of the taints, the asavas. So I'm going to come back to this, but first I want to deal in greater detail with the task of freeing the mind from the five hindrances. So these are called the 
five defilements of the mind, which prevent the mind from being becoming malleable, wieldy, and luminous, which make the mind brittle and prevent it from being properly concentrated for the destruction of the taints. And so to be able to gain that power of mind by which one can gain samadhi and then use that samadhi to liberate the mind, we have to overcome the five hindrances, not by eradicating them. Eradicating them comes later with the development of wisdom, but in the stages of practicing for the attainment of samadhi, for the development of concentration, the barrier that we face in the, at the outset of practice and for a long time, especially during our day-to-day -day life, is the invasion of the mind by the five hindrances. And so we have to understand these hindrances to know what they are, to know how they arise, and what can be done, what kind of practices are suitable for weakening, debilitating these five hindrances, specific practices that we could engage in to weaken the five hindrances so that when we come to the meditative practice, then we can overcome them entirely. Okay, so first we have sensual desire. And we have to also say that for different people, uh, let's say different for different people, different hindrances among these five hindrances will be more prominent. So some people will have major cut problem, barrier, meet a major barrier with sensual desire. For other people, it will be ill will. For others, it will be sluggishness of mind, drowsiness, tendency to get drowsy and sleepy when they're trying to do meditation. Other people are overcome, frequently overcome by restlessness wild thoughts, the crazy mind, the monkey-like mind. In other people, just find themselves always saddled with doubt, uncertainty, perplexity, indecisiveness. And among these five hindrances, I would group them, first divide them into two broad categories. And this is my own way of handling them. Um, I haven't seen this in any sutta or commentary, but I would put the first two, I would describe as the heavy, the heavy hindrances, sort of the, the major hindrances, the major barriers. And then the other three, I would call the lighter hindrances. Okay, then of the first two, okay, sensual desire. And this is kama chanda or kama raga, and it's desire for the pleasures of the five senses. And even though this can apply to the pleasures in, in, obtained from any of the sense objects, but the Buddha is speaking, usually when he's speaking about the five hindrances, he's speaking to monastics. And for those who enter upon the monastic life, which involves the commitment of celibacy, the sensual desire in, almost invariably takes the specific form of sexual desire. And so the Buddha says, here I wanted to go into Yeah, in the Anguttara Nikaya, in the Book of Ones, we find a group of suttas on abandoning the five hindrances. But let me go through all of the suttas in turn, uh, all of the hindrances in turn first. Okay, so sensual desire 
can be desire through any of the five senses for any kind of sense object. It could be like some people are obsessed with beautiful music heard through the ears. Other people, it might be delicious tastes. Others, it can be very fine touch sensations. But the major manifestation of central desire, I think that the Buddha has in mind when he's, especially when addressing the monastics, is sexual desire, which when many monastics, especially younger ones, when they sit down to meditate, it's the sexual desire which arises in the mind. Images for the males, usually images of beautiful, attractive women, for women, it might be the longing for a relationship with a man, and so on. Okay, ill will has a vast range from strong hatred to resentment towards others, towards little explosions of irritation, anger, um, annoyance. So that is ill will. Dullness and drowsiness, we have two hindrance here, in, two hindrances here. And the way I understand the distinction between them, dullness, or in Palitina, is a kind of heaviness of mind or brittleness of mind. So that the mind becomes you know, somewhat heavy. And I compare this to Sort of the way I visualize this to myself, it's like these days when the sky is covered with this sheet of gray clouds. So you don't see individual clouds floating by, or you don't see like individual clouds that you could isolate against the blue background, but it's just like this unbroken expanse of gray cloud, heavy gray cloud covering the entire sky. And that induces a kind of heaviness in the mind. And so that heaviness or brittleness of the mind is like Tina, where you can't do anything with the mind. You try to bring the mind to the object, to focus the mind on the object, but the mind is just dull and heavy, unwieldy. And then when that happens, what often follows next is that the mind starts to sink into drowsiness, to get sleepy. And then sometimes one will even fall into a little bit of a nap, even while one is sitting in meditation. So that's drowsiness. It's not the natural sleepiness, which is quite, I mean, understandable. But, but when your bedtime comes, then you're going to get drowsy as a signal, time to go to sleep. But this is after you've had a good sleep at night, and then you've been active during the day, but then you sit down to meditate, and then you start to get drowsy and then maybe fall asleep. So that's drowsiness. Restlessness, udacha is this excitement of the mind, this kind of wandering of the mind, distractedness of the mind from thought. One thought after another starts rushing through the mind. So that is restlessness. And remorse is when memories start to surface, recollections, of things that you did wrong, mistakes that you made, um, maybe transgressions that you committed against others, ways in which you might have hurt others, or ways in which you might have violated the precepts, the ethical precepts. So those memories come up and cause this kind of remorse, regret, worry, anxiety over one's transgressions, fears about breaches that might have occurred in your relationships with others. So this is kukucha, which we translate remorse. And then doubt here, 
is not the inquisitive doubt where you have legitimate questions about the Dharma, but it's the kind of uncertainty and perplexity that prevents one from fully settling in to one's practice. So they start surface, surfacing these doubts, popping up, and then preventing you from collecting the mind and focusing the mind on the meditation object. <clears throat> and so to deal with these hindrances, it's important to know how they arise and what can be done to deal with them, to tackle them. And we find some useful information about this in the Book of Ones of the Anguttara Nikaya, which actually I think has artificially created a number of suttas that were probably originally grouped together into a single sutta. But maybe to increase the number of ones, it's broke broke that original sutta up into five divisions. And so here we have the text that says, I do not see even one other thing on account of which unarisen sensual desire arises and arisen sensual desire increases and expands so much as an attractive object. And then for one who attends carelessly, that's an important expression. You can highlight that. For one who attends carelessly to an attractive object, unarisen sensual desire arises, and arisen sensual desire increases and expands. So what is that attractive? object, that attractive object. Let's look at the note here. Okay, so here, this is from the commentary, the Anguttara Nikaya. Here, an attractive object. I changed my translation. Okay. Here, the attractive object. is an object that is a basis for lust. In a way, actually, I have to say that definition is a bit circular. Um, yeah, but I'll, I'll explore this a little more. So, okay, here it says an agreeable object. Okay, that's a little better. An agreeable object, a desirable object that is a basis for lust. And then the important term is a yoni so manasi karoto, that is attending carelessly, which means that one grasps upon that attractive object in the wrong way, in the way sort of looking at its attractive features and fixating on the attractive features rather than trying to turn away from the attractive features or to pierce through the attractive appearance of the object and see into its real nature. To see into the real nature would be to see the object as being impermanent, as being bound up with dukkha, with suffering, to see it as being non-self, to seeing it as being really, when you look beneath the surface, to be unattractive rather than attractive. Okay, and now the text here speaks about the attractive object and it speaks about the attractive object in a, just in a very broad way. And it says that attractive object is the condition, the basis for the arising and expansion of sensual desire. But now to look a little bit more into this, the next group of suttas is helpful. 
And this is the sutta on the obsession, the suttas on the obsession of the mind. And here the Buddha says, first come five suttas spoken from the perspective of a male. So the Buddha says, I do not see even one other visible form that so obsesses the mind of a man as the form of a woman. And so with sound, with odor, taste, and touch. So each of these sense objects of all the different sense objects possible, it's the sight. In the case of a man, it's the sight, sound, odor, taste, touch of a woman that so obsesses the mind. And in relation to the five hindrances, that is so much, that is so powerful a cause for the arising and expansion of sensual lust. And then the same holds taking the perspective of the woman. So there's no other form, sound, odor, taste, touch that so obsesses the mind of a woman that causes sensual desire to arise in the mind of a woman as the sight, sound, and so forth, touch of a man. Okay, so that is the condition, the cause or condition for the arising of sensual lust. The next is the arising of ill will. What causes ill will to arise? And the text says that the primary condition for the arising and expansion of ill will is a repugnant object. And the Pali term, patiganimitta, would be an object something that causes aversion to arise. And the commentary says that this designates a disagreeable object. But other suttas will expand on what are the causes, conditions for the arising of ill will. For example, somebody treats you in disagreeable ways, or you have a suspicion somebody will treat you in disagreeable ways, or somebody treats your friends, your family and friends in disagreeable ways, and that will cause ill will to arise. That's a kind of personalized ill will. But then there can be impersonal ill will towards their different sights and sounds, maybe odors and tastes, touch sensations that are disagreeable, and that can cause ill will to arise. For example, <clears throat> you're trying to do meditation. You have a nice quiet place and then you get outside some disagreeable sound arises. Maybe cars go driving by or, and this really used to irritate me when I was living in a city, the sound of the motorcycle, when I think they take off the muffler so that the, the driver comes by with the motorcycle. <laughs> And I was living in the city and I would be sitting in meditation. And then when those motorcycle would go driving by, just I might be in a quiet, peaceful state and not here. And just wave of anger rises and grumbling. Another thing that could cause <laughs> ill will based on sound when I was sitting, living in, this is many years ago, living in Los Angeles. This is when I was in graduate school or finished graduate school, but before I went to Asia. 
there would be dog barking. Yeah, it seemed that whenever I would sit in meditation, the dog would start barking. And it reached a point <laughs> where <laughs> I would sit in meditation, the dog would start barking from some house in the neighborhood. Then I would go outside. I had the thought that I would go to that house and ring the bell of the people and tell the people, <laughs> I'm trying to meditate. Could you please keep your dog quiet from 8 to 9 p.m. every evening? If they say, what can we do? I say, I would suggest. Well, if you don't have one, you can buy a muzzle for your dog and muzzle the dog between 8 and 9 p.m. So I would go out trying to find the house where the barking dog was. I would come out. I would hear the barking, woof, woof, woof. Then I think, ah, it's in that direction. Then I start to walk in that direction. And what happens? The barking stops. <laughs> So I don't know what house to go to. So then I give up. I go back to my room, sit down, cross my legs, start to meditate again. Mindful in, out, in, out. And what happens? The dog starts barking again. Yeah, anyway, that's a little bit of a, a deviation. Okay, so we have any kind of object that causes anger, ill will to arise, even things like mosquitoes. If you're trying to sit in meditation, mosquitoes come and give you a mosquito bite. Ill will can arise towards the mosquito. Okay, then we have dullness and drowsiness. And so what is the condition given for that? And I have to say that the sutta is not all that helpful. It seems almost a, a tautological, tautolo the definition seems, seems almost a tautology. So what is the condition for dullness and drowsiness? So discontent or boredom, lack of enjoyment, lethargy. Lethargy is almost a synonym for drowsiness. Lazy stretching, that's just the product. When you get drowsy, you stretch. Then drowsiness after meals, again, pretty much the same thing as drowsiness. And sluggishness of mind is pretty much the same thing as dull, dullness. So I just don't see how that definition. Sorry, Bhante. Can I um, just now just uh, the double the Adjective object at the down at the explanation. Say just again. To let you know. Say again. There's a double the at the attractive object at your explanation at the bottom. Just now you were amending the attractive object. Yeah, the in front there's a double the just to let you know. In the footnote. <laughs> yes, the footnote. There's a double the attractive object in front. There's a double the just to let you know. Oh, I, yes. See, I see. Yes, yes. I yeah, see. just to let you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's see where we were. Okay. So this, yeah. So the explanation of how dullness and drowsiness arise, it seems almost to be tautological. So I would just have to say that dullness and drowsiness, just sort of their natural dispositions of the mind, and maybe from what I would say is a lack of interest in the meditation. And so what one has to do is arouse some way to arouse enthusiasm or an active interest in the meditation. Maybe you could think that this is the way that the Buddha taught through the overcoming of dukkha, this is the way to enlightenment. This is the path followed by all the Buddhas and the arhats of the past. Or, so that's a way of the carrot approach, a positive inducement. 
or you could think of the possible fruits of overcoming dullness and drowsiness. And then there's the whip or stick approach of reflecting on the inevitability of old age, sickness, and death, and the need to overcome old age and sickness and death, developing a kind of perception of danger, adinava sanya, to dispel dullness and drowsiness. And there are various suttas that deal with overcoming dullness and drowsiness. In the Anguttara Nikaya, I remember, I think it's in the Book of Eights, the Sevens or Eights, where the Buddha speaks to Mahamogalana, the Venerable Mahamogalana, because in his own meditation practice, Mogalana was subject, even Mogalana, subject to dullness and drowsiness. And he would keep on nodding off into sleep when sitting in meditation. So the Buddha explained to him various ways of overcoming dullness and drowsiness. For example, one way is to do a quick, a rapid walking meditation, or to get up from one's meditation seat and um, splash ice cold water over the face very cold water. So there are various methods of overcoming dullness and drowsiness. Okay, then restlessness and remorse. Also, I have to say that the definition of the, con or the explanation of the condition seems a little bit, again, tautological. That is where, you, where you're defining a term by way of itself. And so what is the condition, the main condition for the arising of restlessness and remorse and the expansion of restlessness and remorse? It's an unsettled mind. And a vupasanta citta, that's a mind that's not peaceful. And so a mind that's not peaceful is a mind that's troubled by restlessness and remorse. So it, it seems that you're defining the term by way of itself. But what is the condition in my own experience for the arising of restlessness and remorse? Well, what I find the condition for arising of restlessness, I say it's just a deeply ingrained tendency of the mind. And so we don't have to worry very much about the condition for the arising of restlessness, but what is the means of overcoming restlessness? And that is what I'll come to just in the next section. And then what is the condition for the arising of doubt and for the expansion of doubt? That is attending carelessly. And actually another sutta says, one attends carelessly to things that are the basis for doubt. And again, it's almost a tautological definition, but maybe the solution is attending properly or wisely to things that are the basis for doubt. Anyway, the next group of suttas speak about the means or methods for overcoming the five hindrances. And this is where it can be more useful. Okay, so here the, sutta, the Buddha says, I do not see any other thing that prevents the arising of unarisen sensual desire and brings about the abandoning of arisen central desire as the mark of the unattractive or an unattractive object. And in the Buddhist meditative tradition, this expression, the unattractive object, has a, a kind of specific denotation. It designates 
of particular particular meditation objects. And these can be, but particularly the one that's recommended in the suttas is the meditation on the unattractive nature of the body. And so for this, one will focus on the body. The text always recommends beginning with one's own body, reviewing the body from the top of the head to the soles of the feet, bounded by skin as full of different unattractive constituents. And the usual formulation is 32 impure or unattractive um, constituents of the body, starting from the external features, hairs of the head, hairs of the body, nails, teeth, skin, then removing the skin to come to the flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, then digging deeper into the organs, kidneys, heart, lungs, diaphragm, liver, spleen, um, lungs, and so forth, and then the fluids of the body, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, and so on, saliva, nasal mucus, and one reviews those parts of the body over and over. And in time, that dispels the illusion of beauty or attractiveness, and one sees the real nature of the body. Yeah, so that is the one method for overcoming sensual desire. Another method can be the reflection on death or even the reflection on old age, illness, and death. And so one can reflect on one's own, own old age, illness, or, or death. Or in the case of, say, one gets the mental image of an attractive person, say, a monk is meditating, and then the image, a young monk, and then the image of a beautiful young girl appears to his mind. So one method he can use is to reflect that now this girl, maybe 17, 18 years old, is beautiful and attractive. But then you think of her when she reaches her 60s, 70s, 80s. And then after reaching the 80s, she passes away and then the body decays. Where is all of that beauty and attractive gone? Beauty and attractiveness gone, vanished, dispelled, and now the unattractive nature has appeared. Okay, so these are some of the ways of overcoming sensual desire by focusing on the unattractive qualities or potential of the object. Okay, then. The most effective method for overcoming ill will is the liberation of the mind by loving kindness. So this we're familiar with because we practice this. If you join our regular Wednesday meditation group, we use the metta loving kindness as the main meditation object. On Saturday, we do the short loving kindness meditation. So if you do a regular even short periods of the loving kindness meditation, it helps to overcome ill will. Then to overcome dullness and drowsiness, the, what's mentioned here is called the element of instigation, the element of persistence, the element of exertion. So these are three stages of arousing energy. So the stage of instigation is initially arousing one's energy. Then as one maintains that energy, the energy becomes the element of persistence. And then when the energy gains strength and becomes invincible, it becomes the element of exertion. So when we're troubled by dullness and drowsiness, what we have to focus on is the element of instigation to find ways of 
arousing energy. And that can be done, as I mentioned, through the two approaches, the carrot reflecting on the benefits of arousing energy and dispelling dullness and drowsiness, or the stick method reflecting on the dangers of remaining under the grip of laziness, of dullness and drowsiness. Okay, then we come to the method for overcoming unarisen restlessness, for preventing unarisen restlessness and remorse from arising, and for abandoning arisen restlessness and remorse. So here the text mentions, it says pacification of the mind, um, which is vupasanta chitasa, that is a mind which is pacified or quieted down by jhana, jhana or by insight, which maybe is not so helpful um, without further detail. So what I would say generally, when there's restlessness and remorse, one has to find a particular method, whatever method you, you find useful or helpful for abandoning for removing that restlessness and remorse. In some suttas, the texts mention, mention as an antidote to agitation of the mind or distractedness of mind, mindfulness of breathing. And so you can use mindfulness of breathing. You could try to use it as an initial tool for overcoming restlessness and remorse. Because when the mind can focus on the breath, then the waves of disturbing thoughts settle down, they sort of fade out, and the mind can settle down and focus happily and peacefully on the in and out breathing. But sometimes, in fact, for many people, it's too difficult when the mind is disturbed by restlessness and worry and the army of, distract, of distracting thoughts. It's just too difficult to settle on the breath. So one method that you can use and that I found helpful in my own experience is to go to full body awareness and just to be aware of the body in the sitting position, just focusing on the whole body. You could use the mental note, just sitting, sitting, sitting. Or what you can do if you find it too difficult to maintain continuous awareness of the body in the sitting position, you can use touch points and move the mind through these touch points. Because in this way, you're keeping the mind active. You're applying an active mind, and yet you're using the active mind in a systematic way. In, and it's a way that will help to settle the restless mind. So the touch points can be for example, the touch of each of the buddhak on the meditation seat. So first, right buddhak, left buddhak. Then you can go to the knees, right, if you're sitting on a mat, right knee, left knee. Then you can come to the, if you have the hands on the lap, you can come to the touch of the arm against the side, right arm against the right side, left arm against the left side. And then the touch of the hands, one hand against the other, or even the thumb, one thumb against the other. Then go back to the buddhak, right buddhak, left. Right knee, left knee. 
right arm, left arm, thumbs touching, and go through that in a circle. So now you're using an active mind, but the mind is moving through a predetermined circuit. And so it helps the mind to settle down. And then once you get the mind has moved through the circuit several times, then you can go back to the full body awareness. And then from full body awareness, you can move to the in and out breathing. Okay, then for methods of abandoning doubt, Okay, what the text says is no, nothing so effective as careful attention. But what I would say, the method for overcoming doubt, if you have like inquisitive doubts, like points of Buddha's teaching that are troubling the mind, then you can inquire from a knowledgeable person, go to a Buddhist teacher to ask the questions, or turn to Buddhist texts to read, out, read up about them. But if you're troubled by just the, what I call the perplexed, the, the skeptical doubt, or the, um, just the restless kind of perplexity, the invasive doubt, which is just stirring up trouble, the best method for dealing with those doubts is just push them away and say, get away. I'm not going to be troubled by you. And then go back to your meditation object. And then if they're really inquisitive doubts, you could think at some other time I will settle those doubts, but I don't have to settle them during the session of meditation practice. Okay, maybe this will do for now for dealing with part of the sutta. I'm going to maybe return to it in the next class as we still have more to deal with in the sutta. But now let's see if any questions have arisen. Okay, so if you have questions, then you use the raise hand symbol. And we start off with Sumina. Thank you, Bhante. Bhante, um, I just wonder with the attractiveness of uh... Of someone, but they yeah. Um, it's usually you attract on uh, by another person. Then why don't you? I just wonder why don't we reflect on the unattractiveness of their body instead of our body? I see. I see. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, what I said is initially one uses one's own body, because I think maybe if we can <laughs> imagine a situation. The Buddha is giving instructions, and don't forget, he has like many young monks there who will be the early 20s. And so he says, do the meditation on attractive, the meditation on unattractiveness. And you could think of the young girls that you see that you, um, that maybe you encounter at the monastery or when you go on your arms round. So the young 22-year-old monk sits down and thinks, so that's what the Buddha has instructed. Then he thinks of that young girl, hairs of the head, hairs of the body, nails, teeth, teeth. Actually, she has very beautiful teeth. Wow, and a nice smile. And I don't find that hair unattractive at all. You know, she has it in a nice ponytail or flowing hair. And wow, such nice limbs and nice breasts. And then before long, you know, he's not focusing on the unattractive, but the attractive. And so you start off by working on your own body. So that way you get the perception of the unattractive. And then when you get sort of deeply grounded, well-grounded in the perception of unattractiveness with one's own body, then one can bring in another person carefully and cautiously. Yeah, so I think that's the explanation. So it doesn't exclude, I say, it doesn't exclude another person, but first you have to gain 
experience with the meditation with that particular meditation subject with one's own body and then one can avert turn to the bodies of others okay mariam thank you Bonte. this was very helpful class i have a couple of things one is for the restlessness for the mind i just wanted to share that one method that I use is I just go through the 32 bodies very quickly so I don't think about them and that settles the mind a little bit. I so for, I for, just dealing with, to... for dealing with the restlessness. Yes. The, the yes, 32 parts I use of the that. body. Okay, that's good. Yes. I mean, there are different, you have to sort of experiment and find what works. Yeah, yeah so yeah. that was that was nice when you said the buttocks and uh, but it reminded me. The other things I wanted to see if you can um share your experience with regard to unattractiveness of the food because that's what my um desire is and uh, i eat a lot and i enjoy it so i wanted yeah. to see what is the <laughs> yeah yeah i think what that what i found uh, the the way it's explained in the work like the visuti mugga that's the, the work translated the path of purification it, the explanation goes that you should focus on how when you put the food into the mouth you chew it and then it forms like a mass of chewed food and if you were to spit that food out and then somebody were to say why don't you eat swallow that again you say no dice i'm not going to put that into my mouth <laughs> So you focus. So you, you think about how the food looks when you chewed it, and then you think of the food going down the esophagus, and then it's in the stomach, and you think of the food getting sort of um, transformed by the digestive juices, and then you think of the food, what used to be the food going through the intestines, and then accumulating in the um in the colon and then coming out in the form of feces <laughs> somebody said why don't you eat that it's just the transformation of your food you say no dice <laughs> yeah that's the instruction in the visuddhi mother okay. but what i found is just when you're chewing the food mindfully you don't have to focus on the way it appears and so on but just take each bite and chew mindfully. And then the sort of fascination or the fixation on the delicious taste vanishes. And you're just aware of chewing a mass of food and then swallowing it. I see. That's yeah, so helpful. the way I teach when we're doing a meditation retreats to do that, to contemplate the eating process in five phases, taking up the food putting it into the mouth, chewing it, tasting it, and swallowing it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, David. So, Bhante, my question is um, about doubt. And really, I, you know, over the years, I've uh, gone from uh, questioning some of the, the, the teachings and so on to you know, to great confidence in the Buddha and his Dhamma. Yeah. But the doubt that I struggle with is self-doubt, you know, about my own ability to make progress and to eventually yeah. achieve liberation. Does the, do this, the scriptures uh, address that in particular? I don't think that they comprise that under the heading of doubt. But what I would say, like, to deal with that kind of... Um, maybe lack of confidence in oneself. Yeah, that's what it would be, lack of self-confidence rather than doubt. Even like some reflections, even like if you know anything like about the life stories of some of the Buddha's great disciples, like you could see that many of them started just like quite ordinary people, you know, just like oneself. And maybe they had in order to achieve liberation under the Buddha, they would have had to have maybe accumulations of merits and paramis from many past lives. 
But you could think from many, you know, long ago, deep in the Sangsaric past, they were very confused, um, ordinary people with many troubles and defilements. And you could think that I'm now I'm far advanced beyond many of them. <laughs> and so if they could do it, if they could reach the goal just through persistent practice, commitment to the Buddha's teaching, I can do the same, even though it might take a long time, many lives, but I can do it. Yeah, even I remember there's a verse in the Shanti Deva's Bodhicharya Avatara, that I think it was in the Bodhicharya Avatara, that all of those who became Buddhas in the past, at some point, long in the past, had just been worms. <laughs> <laughs> but those worms, somehow through the working of karma, had worked their way up through the samsaric process and then became fully enlightened Buddhas. So I think the challenge becomes is that the more I practice over the, these past many years, the more aware I become of all my defilements. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, I mean, that's a good sign in itself. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It's the, yeah, very that's how, yeah, that's how one learns what has to be done to overcome them. Okay, we'll go on to Lee. Li Wei. Hello, Auntie. Thank you so much. I um, wanted to ask for the five, uh, all these five hindrances, where does tension come in? Like when you meditate and you get tension, you feel uh, a bit... Uh, wait, uh, I'm not getting the voice very clearly. Um, when, get... If you feel very tense when you meditate. Oh, tension. Uh, tension. Yes. Yeah. Where does it fall under these hindrances or uh, it doesn't really apply you know, maybe it doesn't fall so neatly under the five hindrances yeah i don't quite know where to put it under the five hindrances but if the mind becomes sort of tense when one is meditating i think one has to find a, a way to relax it and maybe a good way to relax it is the full body awareness because then you're not trying i think the mind becomes tense when you're trying to focus too narrowly on a small area particularly it happens with many people when doing mindfulness of breathing focusing just on the area of the nostrils say then because you have to put the mind on a small area and so in that case the mind can become tense so a good way what I find helpful is to fall back on the full body awareness and then to be aware of the breathing in and out, but not trying to focus the breath on a small area, but to be aware of the whole body in the act of breathing. And then when you get sort of relaxed and familiar with the whole body breathing, then you can bring the mind back to the small area. Yeah, but just experiment to also maybe something like walking meditation could help to break up the tension. You just have to experiment to see what works. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we'll take, maybe I have time for one more question and I already gave Sumana a chance. So, Diane? Yes, uh, good morning, Bante. Good morning. Uh, in my opinion, ill will, restlessness, remorse are rooted uh, by greed and delusion is the main cause. Is there other cause I overlook that ill will arisen independently? Like why people become ill will or hate because they don't get what they want. They don't get what they desire and they get agitated or they get angry because of that. Maybe not only because of that. Sometimes just say in human relationships, you know, just as human relationships develop sometimes, yeah, maybe it's because somebody doesn't do things that you expect them to do or doesn't live up to your desires. It seems to be a topic for a whole psych, psych, uh, psychology textbook. 
to understand the, the underlying roots of ill will. Yeah, so maybe I can't deal with that all just now. Right, thank you. Okay, okay. Alve so maybe we could take Alvina, you had a question. Uh, sure, Bhante, I just wanted to share my experience. I feel striving is, uh, you know, a big distraction when you're trying to achieve something, you know, whether it's in your meditation or that causes, at least for me, it causes, you know, remorse and just a multitude of uh, issues. And I think for meditation, if we create an environment during the day itself, if we say today I'm going to sit for one hour, which is what I do one hour is a big chunk of time to take out. So if you start preparing during the evening itself, you know, clearing up your schedule, distractions, etc. By the time you sit, yeah. it just yeah. becomes a lot more easier. That's uh, that's yeah. I, 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 I think me. that's actually a good observation that a lot of the sort of restlessness and uh, yeah, the restlessness and agitation arises because people are striving too much with the expectation, I have to attain something, I have to get something, I have to succeed, I have right. to reach jhana, I have to get these deep yeah. insights. So I like rather the idea that comes maybe in, maybe it comes in the Soto Zen tradition, that it's the idea of non-attainment. <laughs> like <That's true. laughs> you're, you're sitting not for the purpose of attaining something, yeah. but just, for the purpose of the practice itself. The practice itself is said that, I remember the saying of Do, Dogen, the philosopher Dogen. of Soto Zen, Dogen. Right. Like one hour of sitting is one hour of being a Buddha. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So just yeah. even yeah. though your mind is full of restless thoughts, agitation, worry, sensual desire, ill will, but when you're sitting with all of those disturbing thoughts in the mind during that period you're a buddha or a buddha. Yeah. <laughs> it's not I, I don't want to be uh disrespectful or anything but you're sitting as a buddha with restless mind with ill will <laughs> with sensual yeah. desire <laughs> but just sit and focus on your object or observe your mind and that will help the mind to settle down That's Okay, we'll have to end the session now. And then this is the sixth. So next week I go to Russia. We go to Russia for the class for the Russian speakers. And so you're welcome to join us, but it'll be a different link. The link will be sent out during this week. And I'll be dealing next week with karma and rebirth. And then we come back to the Anguttara Nikaya the following Saturday. And we'll we'll spend more time on this sutta and some related suttas. Okay, so let me end with the sharing of the merits. So we share the merits with the devas, the nagas, the fear spirits, asking them to protect the Dharma, to protect ourselves and others. Akasa ta jabuma ta Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantam Anumodipa Chirangra Kantu Sasanam Akasa Ta Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantam Anumodipa Chirangra Kantu Deisanam Akasa Ta Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantam Anumodipa Chirangra kantu mang parang, tu ka pata chani du ka, baya pata chani baya, soka pata chani soka, antu sabeti pani no. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. There you go.
Sadhu. 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 Sadh